the angel of the Lord. Rashi says in his introduction to Zechariah chapter 1, the prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. Nonetheless, I will put my heart to recounseling the verses one by one according to the interpretations that resemble it and follow the interpretation of Jonathan. This is God's test for the Jewish people, in particular the Jewish leaders. God's test of who the descendant of David is. The man described in Isaiah 53, the teacher of righteousness. That's who Rashi, known, known as one of the first rabbis, to say that Isaiah 53 described the people, uh, the Jewish people, as uh, the patriarch Israel. Then here he is in Zechariah, saying, um, "We got to have the uh, to, to know the truth of at least chapter one of Zechariah to know its truth, because we can't do it, and and no." Jewish man, religious, academic, commentator, or otherwise, has ever had the answer to this. And yet this video is going to give it to you. Why? I'm a teacher of righteousness. This is Zechariah chapters 1, chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. That's the preamble that Rashi leads into before he starts his commentary. And this is in Midrash form. That's where I take parts of a verse and interpret each uh, uh, in individual segments. Verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month of the second year of Darius, the month of Shabbat, this word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo. This word of the Lord. This verse continues with, In the night I had a vision, which is not a word of the Lord. The word of the Lord coming to Zechariah means the messenger of the words of God has come to Zechariah, who is the angel of God's presence, and the word of the Lord. Literally, that's his name. He has alighted upon Zechariah to bring a vision from God. Not a word, a vision. Verse 8. In the night I had a vision. I saw a man mounted on a bay horse standing among the myrtles in the deep. And behind him were bay, sorrel, and white horses. In the night I had a vision. There's a man on a horse standing in the myrtles. He is later referred to as the angel of the Lord, standing in the myrtles. The angel of the Lord alights upon and enters men, and my name, Hashem, is in him and can speak through the man. Zechariah has an angel with him who is his guide in the vision. The deep is like a valley Zechariah is looking down on, filled with myrtle trees. And then an open area below that is where the bay, sorrel, and white horses are. Verse 9. I asked, what are those, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered, I will let you know what they are. What are those, my Lord? Zechariah is not talking to the angel. That's an angel. It's not, it's not my Lord. Who answered, but who never lets him know what they are. 
He is asking the man standing among the myrtles on a bay horse about the horses in the open area and calls him my Lord. Verse 10. Then the man who was standing among the myrtles spoke up and said, These were sent out by the Lord to roam the earth. Then the man who was standing among the myrtles spoke up and said, Again, this is Midrash form. Okay, so the man standing in the myrtles answers the question of Zechariah, not the angel who is with Zechariah. Verse 11, And in fact, they reported to the angel of the Lord, who was standing among the myrtles. We have roamed the earth and have found all the earth dwelling in tranquility. And it seems like a dream. We have horses talking. <clears throat> you know, there could have been birds. Anything that can go far and uh, go a long ways out and then come back. In this case, for this story or for this dream that was given to Zachariah, it's horses. And in fact, they reported to the angel of the Lord. They who reported are the horses who have gone to and fro throughout the earth, and they spoke the report to the angel of the Lord, who was standing among the myrtles. The angel of the Lord, who was standing among the myrtles, has alighted upon and injured the man standing amongst the myrtles. The angel of the Lord is using this man as his visible presence. You cannot see the angel of the Lord. Just as he once used a burning bush for his visible presence, and God spoke through him to Moses. Not just as his visible presence, he also used the man to say, These were sent out by the Lord to roam the earth. In other words, it sounded like the answer was coming from this man. But it's coming from the angel of the Lord, and God is in that angel, his presence. Because that's the angel of his presence. You can find that in Isaiah chapter 63. I don't recall the verse. I never see anything on the angel of his presence. Wherever God's presence is, the presence that enters the temple, I never hear any mention of the angel that has to be with him. Why? It's the angel of his presence. Who is the angel of the Lord? Yeah, I believe, and I'm not certain about this, but I've, I've heard it at least one or two times, and that is Christianity believes the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Thereupon the angel of the Lord exclaimed, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? Thereupon the angel of the Lord exclaimed, Okay, so the angel of the Lord exclaimed through the man. Zechariah heard the words come from the man standing in the myrtles. It is the only way Zechariah could have heard the words. The angel of the Lord can only speak to the man he has alighted upon. Ezekiel describes this as, A spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? The following verses are from the book of Isaiah regarding this curse. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. So I profaned the holy princes, I abandoned Jacob to proscription and Israel to mockery. That, of course, is God speaking. The profaning of the holy princesses is God's prophecy of the banishment of King Jeconia and all his offspring from ever ruling over Judah and Jerusalem again. The line of the kings of Judah ended. The line described king by king in the first book of the New Testament of Christianity. 
the line of Jesus. The abandonment and mockery are God's prophecy that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of the Israelites would be defeated and deported from the promised land. Isaiah witnessed the deportation of the northern kingdom, but the deportations of the southern kingdom were many years after his death. This is chapter 43, verses 5 through 7. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your folk from the east, will gather you out of the west. I will say to the north, give back, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, all who are linked to my name, who I have created, formed, and made for my glory. Okay, this is God's prophecy that all the tribes of Israel would return from the Assyrian deportations of the tribes east of the river Jordan that were Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and all the tribes of the northern kingdom deported by Assyria, defeated and deported, and the Babylonian deportations of the southern kingdom. It is a prophecy that is specific to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. This prophecy was fulfilled according to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and their account of all 13 tribes returning to the southern kingdom of the lands of Benjamin and Judah. Jerusalem is within the lands of Benjamin and his lands are considered part of the kingdom of Judah since that is where the kings of Judah rule from. Ten tribes being lost and not returning is a myth. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites being settled in their towns, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem, as the man Israel, all of them. When the people Israel gather as one man, it is all twelve tribes, who were allotted lots of the promised land, and the Levites, they did not receive a portion. They were allowed to go from lot to lot, tribe to tribe, and everybody was supposed to take care of them. Uh, the Levites, that would be Levi, the son of Levi, the priestly tribe without an allotment of the promised lands. Judahites and Benjaminites alone are not Israel though all references to Israelites would include them. All of Israel had returned together to Jerusalem and Judah, mindful of the imported Gentiles in the northern kingdom, imported by the Assyrians, many of whom tried to stop the building of the second temple. This is why everybody returning, all 13 tribes, all went to Judah. The northern kingdom was occupied by Gentiles, I would assume Assyrians and Arabs. This is 1 Chronicles chapter 9 verses 2 and 3. The first to settle in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants while some of the Judahites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and Manessasites settled in Jerusalem. That would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was such a large tribe, it had to be broken in. It was broken in two. Half of it uh, set up their lot allotment was east of the River Jordan by about where Edom would be. And, and well, that was the tribe of Gad, uh, not Adam, uh, Gilead, where the Tishbite, Elijah, the Gentile, was an inhabitant. Ramoth, Gilead. Manessites, Ephraimites, and Judahites were the tribes with the largest allotment of the lands of Abraham, and Jerusalem is in the lands of the Benjamites. Those are who just got mentioned. The three largest lot owners, okay, Benjamin, that's where Jerusalem is, he's important, and of course the priests, the Lamites. 
So Ephraim and Manasseh were not lost tribes, as many believe from writings outside of the Bible. There never were lost tribes according to the Bible. Okay, so all 13 tribes returned and settled in new towns. The accounts of the deportations indicate there was not much left of the old towns. There is no account of how the new towns were settled, though it is unlikely it was based on prior ownership. The exile lasted too long for the deported owners to still be alive, and the tribes of the northern kingdom had to build new towns to live there. It also says the Levites settled in their, uh, on their lands. So everybody had to pick and choose, and, you know, I'm sure the, <laughs> the strong and wealthy got the best places, and, and, and again, many just settled in Jerusalem. Okay, this is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 14. Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon. I will bring down all her bars, and the Chaldeans shall raise their voice in lamentation. This is God's prophecy that Assyria would be conquered by the Babylonians, who were defeated by the Chaldeans. But they actually go back and forth and actually became somewhat intermingled, Chaldeans and ba uh, Babylonians. And that he would raise up the Gentile anointed king Cyrus of Persia to conquer them to clear the way for all the tribes to return. That's how he, he cleared the way to the desert or made rivers for them. Basically, he got Cyrus to release them. Chapter 43, verse 25. And I never hear anything about this. It is I, I who, for my own sake, wipe your transgressions away and remember your sins no more. Okay, this is God doing, and he says it, it's something new. I'm going to do something new uh, for the Israelites. This story repeats with the new covenant that includes sin forgiveness of the Jewish people that arise with Elijah and the angel of the covenant after the exiles of the Roman dispersal return to the land of Israel in a time to come. That's from Jeremiah chapter 31. The Jewish people have returned from the Roman dispersal of them throughout the world, the diaspora, which means outside of the promised land, outside of Israel, to a land that lay desolate for more than 2,000 years until after the Holocaust and they created the state of Israel in 1948. Seventy years later, and that's funny too because they talk about a curse uh, of 70 years. That 70 years, I believe, just applies to the last of three deportations of, of Judah and the defeat by the Babylonians because the uh, the northern kingdom had, had been defeated and deported long before that and the first to be defeated and taken to the lands of Assyria was Gad, the half tribe of Manasseh, the, the lands east of the river Jordan. Seventy years later the land blooms again and Jerusalem has been rebuilt as a great city larger than it was in ancient times. According to God's words in Jeremiah 31, the time to come to deliver the new covenant with sin forgiveness is here. That's very important for the interpretation for the interpretation of, of at least chapter 1 of Zechariah. That means the angel of the covenant that you desire of Malachi 3 is on his way, followed by God and the messenger Elijah. And when God's third temple is built, he will return to it suddenly. This is the day of the Lord. That's Malachi chapter 3. Now, Zechariah is in Jerusalem. And the construction of the second temple is about to begin. Isaiah has written God's words of sin forgiveness, which would have removed the curse long before this when they were returning, when the remnant of the 13 tribes was returning. And the angel of the Lord proclaims, O Lord of hosts, 
How long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? Okay, this vision of Zechariah and the words of the angel of the Lord through the man standing in the myrtles regarding the curse 70 years ago is to make Zechariah think and try to understand why the angel of the Lord would say this. From his perspective, the curse was lifted. He was back in Jerusalem with all the tribes preparing to build the second temple. The vision is for Zechariah to find out how and when the curse was lifted. And, and that's important today because this is the day of the Lord. The new covenant is here. And this every single Jew throughout the world is forgiven of their sins right now. And that message has been given to me to be delivered. And it's not getting out there. It's just not getting out there. And that's what happened here. Because if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, it's clear they had no idea that their slates had been claimed. And sinning continued. You know, once you know that God has, has just said, okay, I'm not going to remember any of that. Let's all start fresh. I'm here with the covenant of friendship. Let's everybody start being observant Jews. Okay? Which would include going to Yom Kippur. Having a slate clean does not mean you have a lifetime now of sin forgiveness. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah reveal, this is how God had me write it down. This is from the book, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord, that was dictated to me. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah reveal that the 13 tribes did not know they had been forgiven. Uh, right. We had to wait for the teacher of righteousness to know. And this is another thing I never see in this uh, messianic era that is taught, uh, that is coming, <clears throat> is that God is with the, uh, the descendant of David as he was with Moses. I mean, just right there with him. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah reveal that the 13 tribes did not know they had been been forgiven of their sins to be a holy seed in the building of the second temple. If people know they have been forgiven and have a clean slate from past transgressions against God and his laws, they are more likely to stop their sinful ways and abide by his laws in the future. The scroll of Isaiah needs to be found and interpreted by Zechariah and the religious leaders so they will know of God's forgiveness of their sins. God will be returning before the temple is built. That would be the third temple. To test the devotion of his righteous servant and make him suitable for his purpose, which might prosper. That includes the building of the third temple. This would begin when his spirit alights upon the anointed one, Mashiach. His presence with his righteous servant will be necessary for the temple to be rebuilt. Islam will not freely hand over their third most holy site to Israel and abandon the Dome of the Rock Mosque, a mosque that sits on the Temple Mount purchased by King David for God, the most holy site of the Jewish people. With God is the angel of his presence who is already on the way. You want me to skip that? Okay, this has been covered in other videos more than once. The prophet like Moses will have other similarity to Moses beyond writing God's words at his command and direction. As this was written, at God's command and direction, I typed those words. To the greatest degree possible for any human being, Moshe's identity and existence became one with the Creator. Now that's how you, who you're looking for when you say the prophet like Moses. It's not Joshua. I've heard that one. Which is, you know, it says right there on that page, there's never been another prophet like Moses. Well, his attendant Joshua standing right there. If that's... Anyway. 
Moshe's identity and existence became one with the Creator. I don't think you can say that of Joshua. I don't think you can say that of any man until the Spirit of God alights upon him in chapter 11 of Isaiah. He surrendered himself to God to the extent that our sages say the Shekinah, divine presence, which is the angel of his presence who is the Holy Spirit. He's an angel. And his body is not human form with wings. His body is the Spirit of God. Wherever God is, his Spirit is. Wherever his presence is, the angel of his presence is. They're always together. So when they align upon a man and say, uh, okay, we have tasks for you, that man immediately becomes a man of divine beings. And that's, that's the shaking all. That's the Spirit of God and the presence of God entering into the temple, which would include the angel of his presence. The shaking all spoke through Moshe's throat. As I have mentioned, God can speak through me. You're only going to know it just like with the man standing in the myrtles by the words that are spoken. Okay? Because it's my voice. But it's not me. You know, I can tell the difference. You can't other than... Those would be how God would state it. And you can, if you watch closely, you can see it happen in all these videos. I mean, for the most part. Where God just, you know, he just throws out a sentence or two. <laughs> and I, I just keep going, you know. I let him get done and I just pick up from there. We've been working on this for over 13 years. That's from the Zohar, Volume 3, page 232 uh, A. And then it says, i.e., he was God's veritable mouthpiece on this earth. That's from the Sefer Hashikos 5749, volume 1, page 290, and a footnote. The prophet, like Moses, will also have the answer to these questions. Quote, the great Jewish philosophers try to understand the question of how Moses heard God literally. Some insisting that God spoke actual words and Moses heard them with his ears. While others suggest that God's speech was communicated silently to Moses' intellect and only uttered in sound by Moses himself. Memonides, Rambam, even as he affirmed the communication between God and Moses as a fundamental Jewish belief, ultimately conceded the mysteriousness of that process. The entire Torah reached Moses from God in a manner which is figuratively described as speech, but no one has ever known how that took place except Moses himself, whom that speech reached. This commentary on the Mishnah, Sanhedrin, chapter 1. Well, I have the answers, and I've been telling you the answers. God is in his spirit. Spirit enters into you, because we find it in Ezekiel. There's where God tells you. God was telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, get up on your feet. Ezekiel says, at that very moment, a spirit entered into me, and I could hear the words of God. There it is. When he enters him, now, He's not hearing that through his ears. There's, there's the first question answered. It's not to your ears. And, and there is a silent knowing. That's what we call it, what God has taught me. Now, generally, I just hear words as though they came in through my ears and they're in my mind, as though my eyes and my ears had perceived. But, uh, but he can put just knowledge into my mind without uttering a word. And it's kind of can be pointed out uh, uh, easiest with when he comes to a man and like he came to Samuel and Samuel just says, here I am. It's as though before he speaks to you, and this is what happened with me, he put in a knowledge in my mind that the God of creation was about to speak to me. And so when he did speak, it was as though he had always been there speaking to me. Not unlike how Adam would have felt. But 